Hello folks, welcome to Bio 251, Anatomy and Physiology 1. This is the first mini lecture you're listening to. I will try to keep these as short as possible. Uh, some of them run up close to an hour uh, on some more difficult chapters. I do uh, chunk up the chapters in small enough pieces that I can keep these 10-15 minutes. And for example, this one is 1-1 to 1-3, this first mini lecture. Uh, covers 1-1 to 1-3. First thing we're going to do is look at a video that is an overview of anatomy and physiology. It does cover some of the systems that you won't, we won't talk about this semester. Uh, you eventually talk about all of the organ systems between bio 251 and 252, A and P 1 and 2. This semester we do half of them, approximately half, it's not exactly half. This video covers some of the systems you don't you don't cover this semester but you will in 252 so let's go ahead and take a look the human body is complex full of individual systems that work together to make us whole let's start with the obvious our skin is on the outside and part of our integumentary system our 10-pound waterproof coat protects us from an invasion of germs and chemicals. It also keeps moisture in. And, though our skin is thin, it's complex. In one square inch of a hand, the skin sprouts 30 hairs, holds 9 feet of blood vessels, 134 yards of nerves, 9,000 nerve endings, and 700 pain, heat, and pressure sensors. Our skin is wrapped around the muscles and bones that move our bodies and house internal organs. Each of our 206 bones is light and strong. A skeleton made of steel would weigh five times this much. Our respiratory system connects the outside with our insides through breathing passages. When we inhale, our lungs allow a quick exchange of carbon dioxide and essential oxygen. The circulatory system carries many of life's essentials through the bloodstream, including oxygen. The heart drives this system. The four chambers of this muscle work as two separate pumps. One pumps blood to the lungs to pick up oxygen. The other pumps blood through the body to drop off oxygen and nutrients. Nutrients are made available to the body through the digestive system. Whatever we eat moves from our mouth to the stomach and our intestines, where food is broken down into usable substances and absorbed by the blood or stored for later use. We get rid of undigested parts of food and our excretory system removes excessive liquid waste and regulates the levels of salt in our bodies. The brain behind all these systems is three pounds of soft tissue full of 14 billion nerve cells, give or take a few. Thinking produces electrical signals between these nerves and makes a network of connections. Repeated thoughts and actions build stronger connections. The brain communicates with the rest of the body through the spinal cord. From the brain's perspective, our bodies look like this. Hands, tongue, and lips seem huge because these areas of our skin are loaded with nerves and more sensitive than other parts of the body. The work of procreation is carried out by the reproductive system. When an egg and a sperm get together, another variation on the magnificent human body is in the making. While each of our body's systems operate separately, they depend on each other for support. Together, these systems help us to function and make us human. Okay, so that's an overview of anatomy and physiology. Now, the first thing we want to talk about is, well, what do you care about anatomy and physiology? Well, honestly, you guys are probably taking this because you're nursing students or, or PA students or medical students, something in the allied health. 
So that's why you're taking it. But really, A&P is in everyday life. You can't pick up a newspaper or listen to the news or watch TV without something about anatomy and physiology coming up. There, All these shows are always talking about these tests that have to deal with some physiological principle. In addition, we all have family members that have been sick here and there, and the doctors talk to us, the nurses talk to us, and uh, we need to have a working knowledge of anatomy and physiology. Now, some of you are going to be experts. Some of you are going to go on to be doctors and be experts, and of course you need far greater than a working knowledge. Uh, anatomy is one of the oldest sciences that we have. We have, uh, we have drawings that date back about oh, 1500, whoops, 1500 to 1600 BC. So we see these drawings. Actually, you know what, I should say 1600 to 1500 BC because we are counting down when you're BC. So we have, we have found these drawings that date from 1600 to 1500 B.C. And they're anatomy drawings. Anatomy is one of the oldest sciences that we know. So a very ancient science. The uh, technology that's ever increasing improves how much we know about anatomy and physiology. Now you're going to say, how could that improve my anatomy? Well, only about a decade ago, we discovered uh, a new muscle. A new muscle was discovered only about 10 years ago. So our knowledge is increasing greatly. And as we get better imaging instrumentation, we can see ultrastructure of the cells, and we can, we can even see molecules at this point. So A and P is in our everyday life. Now, what is anatomy and what is physiology? Anatomy is structure and physiology is function. And we always say structure affects function. So how something functions is partly dictated by its structure. And what I've brought in to show you is a picture of some bones in a human, a cat, a whale, and a bat. And what you can see here is these blue bones, or maybe that's purple to you, these are the humerus for all four of these organisms. Now you'll learn, of course, you'll learn this human very well. You'll learn all these bones this semester. But look at the humerus. They're not all that different. So the structure is the same, but is the function the same? Well, it depends how you, how you, how you would define it. The whale uses its, its flipper its, to swim. The bat uses its wing to fly. But the humerus is a structural bone in an appendage, a limb. And it's the structural bone in the limb of all of these organisms. So you can see structure function relationships here. And, and so on and so forth with the rest of these bones. I'm not going to go down through and talk about each one individually. You can see a structure function relationship here. Now when you talk about different functions like the, the flipper to, fit, to swim and the wing to fly, now you can start talking about some differences in, in the structure. So, for example, you can see that the, the metacarpals and phalanges of the bat are, are different than the metacarpals and phalanges of the human or the cat. You can see that because we have tissue designed to, to push air in between these bones. You can see these bones are lengthened. They're exaggerated in length. So you can talk about the similarities and the differences in these structure-function relationships. Medical terminology is huge in anatomy and physiology. Uh, we have what we call word roots and combining forms, and they're all based on Greek, Latin, Greek or Latin mainly. And when you see, when you look at word roots and combining forms, if you see a G like this, it means it's Greek. It would be an L if it was Latin. So it tells you the origin of the word. And you could have a, a word root like sir. That's a root, and it means orange or tawny colored. And you could have a word root like osis, and that means a disease. And then you could put those words together into a combining form, cirrhosis, a disease manifested by a tawny or orange color. And of course, this is what we call that tawny or orange color. We call it jaundice. It's typically due to a liver disease. Could be a gallbladder disease, but typically it's a liver disease. 
so you can see that we have these combining forms from our word roots. We also use many, many prefixes and, and suffixes. I'll, I'll list a couple prefixes. We use prefixes like hypo, that means low, lower than normal, hyper, higher than normal. We use the prefix a or an to mean without, insomnia, without sleep, anorexigenic, without appetite. So you can see that we'll use a or and to mean without, hypo to mean low, hyper to mean high. We use the suffix itis to mean inflammation, etc., etc. You, you probably, you guys probably should take, and some of you have to take medical terminology. It's a fantastic course. A medical terminology course is a fantastic course, and I encourage you all to take one. So that's medical terminology in a nutshell. We uh, have different types of anatomy and physiology. For example, we have gross anatomy. And under gross anatomy, we can study gross anatomy by uh, exterior features, and we call that surface anatomy. How we study anatomy is systemic anatomy. This is how we do it, which means we study the organ systems. Now, I haven't shown you the hierarchy of life yet. I'm about to. But what we study and what your book does is it breaks the body down into organ systems, and that's how you study the anatomy. And likewise, that's how you study the physiology. You study the physiology systemically. But you can see there's different ways to, to study here. I have a, a friend that I went to high school with. He's a medical doctor right now out in Potsdam named Tim Atkinson. And when, he, when we talk about his medical, stool, medical school, he uh, always talks about the regional anatomy. They, they would study regional anatomy. So they would study all the anatomy of, say, the hand. And that means all the anatomy of the hand, the bones, the muscles, the blood vessels, the nerves, everything. So you're crossing across different organ systems, but you're doing everything in that region. And to be honest, we've thought about doing that in this class. We're, we don't know if we're going to try it or not. It has some advantages and it has some disadvantages. So there's different ways to study this. Uh, two words that I'm definitely going to test you on. We have some microscopic anatomy, and cytology means the study of cells. By the way, the suffix ology means the study of, and the prefix cyto means cell, cyte or cyto. Usually you have a, a vowel that, that connects the two roots. So cytology is the study of cells, whereas histology is the study of tissues. And again, I haven't done the hierarchy of life yet, but I will, and you'll see where cytology fits and histology fits. But cytology is the study of cells, and histology is the study of tissues. Clinically, cytologists look at uh, things like pap smears and look for abnormal cells. Clinically, histologists typically prep the tissue for the pathologist. So let me just explain something clinically, as you have a pathologist that runs, that is in charge of, uh, histology and cytology in, in the clinical lab. Matter of fact, the federal uh, identification number called the CLIA number belongs to the pathologist. So we have a pathologist which is a lab director or uh, runs the lab. And under the pathologist, the, this la this, the pathologist has the clinical lab like hematology, clinical chemistry, blood bank, microbiology, etc. And he has cytologists and histologists, and that's what the pathologist does with all his folks. Now, physiology is, is the study of function, and structure and function are always related, as we already talked. The primary, the key principle, the key principle in physiology is homeostasis. If you die, you die because you have the inability to maintain homeostasis. Now you're going to say to me, no, I died because I got hit by a bus. Well, you got hit by a bus, and then you were unable to maintain homeostasis because you were hemorrhaging too much or something like that. You were unable to maintain homeostasis, and your cardiovascular system is a, is a key homeostatic mechanism, and you were unable to keep that running correctly. That's why you died. The key principle of homeostasis... I'm sorry, the key principle of physiology is homeostasis, and we'll talk about that in this chapter. You can see that there's different 
physiologies like cell physiology and organ physiology and systemic physiology. This is what we do. We study physiology by organ systems. Pathophysiology, and in this case we call it pathological physiology, is the study of diseases. So there's a, I'm, I'm taking a pathophys course right now from University of Texas Medical Branch, UTMB. Maybe I'll show you some things from that class. So pathophys, study of diseases. And that's it, folks. The uh, next part will be 1-4, starting out with the hierarchy of life. Uh, and there will be a few sections in that one, too.